So now let's move on. We have our next speaker here. Hello, Louis. How are you? Hello. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to introduce to everybody Louis Kuna, who will uh, speak about soil biodiversity uh, signatures in human made landscapes. Uh, he works as a researcher at the Center for Functional Ecology, and his biggest passion uh, is soil biology. Right, Louis? Yes, that's true. However, Please tell they us are more about yourself. Sorry? Please tell us more about yourself. So I'm a, a researcher at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, but I've been working in Amazonia for the last, well, four or five years. I was really intrigued by a conversation with a colleague there in, a, in actually in a symposium. And he told me about uh, uh, this, uh, the ecosystem that you can find in archaeological sites, which actually reflects the interaction between humans and the environment. And I was really intrigued by that. So we, we developed the project, we went there, and we tried to, to map the biodiversity in these places and compare that to the background, pristine, vigorous forest. And we found some really interesting results that can change how we actually see, perceive the forest. So I'd like to talk about that in, in my talk. Wow, wow. <laughs> well, we are very excited and the stage is yours. Please tell us more. Thank you. Let me bring the presentation up. Can you see it? Can you just confirm? Not yet. Let's give it another second. Oh, this is such a great topic. I can't wait to hear more. Thank you. Yes. It's good, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Olga, for the introduction. And as I said, in this talk, I'll be, I'll be talking a, a little bit about uh, Amazonian uh, soil biodiversity. So my passion uh, as said, uh, is uh, highly focused on the animals that live below ground and the complexity of the interactions between them and the functions that they actually develop in, these, uh, in the soil. So I'll talk a lot about soil today, but also the fauna. And I'll focus on this mega diverse biome that I, I suppose everyone knows, or at least that uh, 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 triggers some curiosity about the Amazon. Obviously, if I would pick one invertebrate would be the earthworm because I, I truly I, I was passionate from the the start when I, I start learning about these animals and the ecology behind the the functions that they develop in the environment. So I, I need to start by basically giving you this uh, concept of the anthropogenic ecosystem, which is basically the ecosystem that is highly manipulated by the human action. So humans are the driving force of the, of the system. They manipulate the biology, they manipulate the chemical, the, the physical structure in, for instance, in the soil. And, and obviously they impose pressure on the environment, not always seen as negative because a, a city can, is considered a, also an anthropogenic uh, system. So it's a system that was generated by human action. But in, in my talk, we are going to focus on uh, historical uh, anthropogenic ecosystems. So, and, and I'm going to start by uh, introducing you to this, uh, also this definition that prevailed for the 20th century, mostly until the 70s, uh, maybe about the counterfeit paradise, where Amazonia, the, the Amazon was seen as a, a, this pristine forest, beautiful, mega diverse, but actually it was a counterfeit paradise because human life or better, the communities living there couldn't achieve complexity because they would keep uh, fighting for their survival. So this is a highly weather environment, not the best soil to cultivate. And the idea was that uh, human complexity could never arise properly under this environment. However, uh, this, the, these views start to get a bit uh, rejected with more findings. And actually what we now know, and there is uh, so much evidence about this, is that actually humans, and in particular before Europeans arrived to, to Amazonia, they, they developed a relationship with the environment that 
uh, uh, allow them to what was defined as the domesticate the the landscape so they they build their uh, their own ecosystem and and rather than actually looking at this as the the as a pristine forest it should be seen as a cultural parkland this was defined in 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 2000 so not far uh, so not long ago that we are actually reframing the perspective about the amazon okay and just to actually give you some some details about what i mean in, in, this is some numbers about the pre-columbian times so how many people were actually living in the amazon and now it's estimated that they were that there was a maybe between 8 million which is a lower estimate up to 50 million which i think is a speculative number but this means and you can see here for instance uh, along the 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 river basins you can see the the black dots are archaeological sites so this is evidence that humans were there uh, well they were everywhere you can see and obviously i'm going to talk about a very specific anthropogenic ecosystem because there are several but uh, this to say that if humans were there and they were everywhere they were interacting with the environment and probably they were changing uh, the environment to to their use and as a general uh, impact so here you can also see that uh, and there is more evidence about plants so crop domestication centers were actually the, the crops that we know today like manioc the they they were also overlapping the places that we consider as the the domestication and centers of the diversity of the crop actually really overlap really well with uh, the again with the human presence along the uh, the Amazon. However, keep in mind that there are still these two two uh, perspectives. How, how extent uh, was the impact of humans in in Amazonia? And there is still a lot of controversy running. Uh, one thing uh, that we can all be sure is that there are patterns that are really, they are better explained by human action. So the, the variability that we see in the, in the forest, in particular in this case are for, for plants, the, how, how uh, plants are uh, distributed in, in the forest is clearly explained by, by interaction uh, of humans or the presence of humans um, in, in the forest. So, and this is uh, uh, one of the big message I bring here today. So if, if Amazonia and probably other tropical regions in the world, they were culturally transformed by people in the past, obviously these change how we should look at the forest and in how we should look at the ecological gradients, the biodiversity distribution, the functioning ecosystem, and obviously how we do conservation. So I'm bringing you today this, so there, there are several anthropogenic ecosystems. Uh, if you look uh, in Google, you'll find uh, several, actually in South America, uh, different ones that basically result from this interaction between humans and, and the environment. But today I'm going to focus on what is defined in the literature as the Amazonian dark earth or in, in Portuguese, terras pretas de índio. And this, the, these, the ecosystem and the soils in this ecosystem are a result from the human intensification activities for thousands of years. So one of the, the, the of, so these soils are dark and that characteristic is based on the incorporation of charcoal. But this charcoal is not just a uh, charcoal for, from a, 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 wool, uh, a firewood, or it is actually charcoal that was pyrogenically created. So it's a charcoal that is created with very low oxygen in the environment or even in the absence of oxygen. So it actually it, uh, keeps the carbon in, in the matter. And then they would incorporate the, the charcoal uh, obviously, if it was intentional or not, this is still highly discussed. But the the, the fact is that we see these these dark soils enriched with with charcoal, and it is actually estimated that these regions occupy up to three percent of Amazonia 
which is a, a, a if you think about Amazonia, it's a huge area. And the interesting thing also about these soils is that they are highly fertile. And if you think uh, the soils in, in tropical forests, they are highly weathered. So, you know, the, they are rainforests. So the weathering leaches, takes away the nutrients and the soils are really poor. They are not the best place if you want to establish agriculture. Okay, so in these specific spots, this, these patches, where humans basically lived. So these are our archeological sites full of artifacts. Uh, the, the soil is really, is rich, is fertile. And actually uh, people in, in Amazon, uh, uh, they seek these soils for agriculture. Just to show you some of the chemical composition. So the, the, why they are so different. So one of the things is the, the pH. So they are less uh, acidic than the soils that you find in the, in the background uh, environment, in background forest. They also have high contents of calcium, phosphorus, magnesium. In contrast, they have low aluminium, which is typical also element found in, in uh, rainforest soils in, in, in the Amazon. And some of these ingredients or these chemical elements that are enriched result from that activity by, by humans when they would, if you can imagine in, 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 the, in the village, they would bring the fruit, they would bring the fish, they, and they concentrate. And this, the refuse ends up in the soil. So actually having a, a high content of calcium and phosphorus, that's, uh, it, it's been uh, suggested that is because of the bones. Uh, of the fish and an animals that they would bring and, and use for their um, feeding. Okay, so uh, these soils and where my research actually started is that if these soils are so different, if these islands uh, among the, the pristine, uh, the, the mega diverse Amazon are there, they must impose important selective pressures. So they have, they are uh, less acidic, high nutrients, high cation exchange uh, capacity. They have, we, we knew that there was already a different vegetation fingerprint and obviously the different land use history uh, resulting from this transformation uh, or uh, resulting from the interaction between humans and, and the environment. So, because of the ability of these soils to, to, to stock carbon to, to go to the charcoal, but not only, not everything is explained by the charcoal, but actually these soils, is, uh, the, this, the environment, the ecosystem here has been proposed as um, one alternative way for agricultural sustainability in the tropics, potentially not only applicable to tropical soils, but to poor soils. And, this has been around for a couple of years. It's not as straightforward as we would imagine, because uh, uh, as you can imagine, the soils that we, these uh, ADEs, the Amazonian dark earths, they were created for thousands of years. So actually creating the, the, the ecosystem is not uh, that, that straightforward. So you can, hear, you can see here, for instance, uh, a maize cultivation after two months. So on the, on the left side, you have on a, a normal lato soil, so normal tropical soil uh, in, in the Amazon. And on the right, you see uh, the maize with two months growth and it completely is exuberant, you know, it's green and is different. Also, just a note that although uh, Amazonian dark earths were, are now well characterized in terms of uh, chemical and the physical traits of uh, ADEs the, are well characterized, we still don't know a lot about biology and that's where I come in, but there is also evidence that in other parts of the world, people were also uh, improving soils in a similar way. So we have cases of these dark soils in Northern Germany, in Europe, but also in India. And what we actually need is to uh, have maybe a, a better look into that relationship of soils and, and humans and understand how in the past we were actually maybe able to improve fertility uh, of these soils without maybe the need of this conventional chemical fertilization, okay? So, 
Souls also very important mes message. Souls should be seen as a living entity. They are not just a matrix, a substrate, inert. They are actually a living complexity. So and uh, all the animals that live under the soil, which still need a lot of research because we don't know uh, a lot about the biology of each specific group, but they. What we know is that they provide essential function, essential benefits for humanity, but also for all the other, uh, for nature in, in general. Also, under your feet lives a huge amount of, you, you, you wouldn't, you need to dig, you need to put your hands on the dirt, on the soil and start looking carefully. And you'll see that you can find up to thousand individuals, thousand animals, in one square meter, okay? So, and not talking even about the microorganisms, I'm talking about visible that you can actually see and naked eye. And it's potentially at least one of the most biodiverse habitats on earth. And uh, some of these animals are actually really important. Uh, they, all, they, all, uh, they are all important. They all have specific functions. They all interact with different uh, animals in a certain way. However, I like to talk about these ecosystem engineers and you can think as a, a, a true engineer in the soil, digging, creating, the, the, uh, creating burrows where the water, air can enter. So they, they, they move soil around, they move the nutrients, they help to, to uh, turn over, uh, they help to turn the organic matter into, again, nutrients for the plants. So these animals are, are actively changing the soil in terms of chemical and physical uh, structure. And you can imagine uh, worms or the termites or the ants that are the true engine. There are several others, but these are uh, the major engineers in the soil. However, for the Amazonian dark birds, there was no no information, okay? So because this environment is so unique uh, among the, the Amazon forest, we thought that there must be a relationship or um, the, the soil fauna fingerprint should reflect somehow the, that interaction with humans. Because if, if the ecosystem imposes this pressure on the environment, there must be a specific biodiversity signature. So one of the first things we actually did was to evaluate biological activity in the soils. And we found out that actually the anthropogenic one, so here you have the ADE, which is the Amazonian dark earth, and the REF, we consider as the reference soil, so the reference background. And we also have old forests, so old regeneration forests, young forests that go up to 20, 30 years. And then also we also included agricultural systems mostly monoculture with soya and maize, okay? So what we have seen is that in the dark soil, the aggregation, which is a measure of biological activity, the aggregation results from the activity of the animals aggregating soil. So for instance, when the earthworm, earthworm poo, so the cast of the earthworm is actually an aggregate, and this uh, engineering changes the, the physical structure and, the, phys and the, uh, the chemical properties of the soil. And we found out that actually in the dark soil, it was higher and significantly higher. So we hypothesized that actually ecosystem engineers were, uh, were developing an interesting role in these soils. And we actually suggested a new model of the, of the genesis of the system where ecosystem engineers would have a, a highly relevant role. And within this role, we know, for instance, that earthworms are able to uh, both modify the physical and the chemical properties of the soil. And also, interesting, uh, I think this is not a well-known fact about earthworms. Earthworms, they are able to capture carbon from the environment, including CO2, so carbon dioxide, uh, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and they make it into a recalcitrant. So they are actually able to get that carbon uh, to stay in the soil by biomineralizing the carbon into a different form, which is really interesting and not a well-known fact about earthworms. So they can actually increase that carbon stock just by taking uh, carbon from the environment and make it in a stable form. But they also stimulate the microbial life 
in, in, in the environment. They change the soil structure the, with so-called phenomena of bioturbation, where they move soil, they move the different size particles from the, the top to, to the bottom and bottom to, uh, to, the, to the top. So they are actively changing and making also nutrients available for plants. Okay, so these animals are really engineering the soil and and uh, so then we we jump to to look at actually the whole biodiversity signature in the soils and and as how could actually the signature reflect this uniqueness of the Amazonian dark earth. So the question is is there a unique diversity in the Amazonian dark earth? In, in this study, which took us three years, we, we evaluate and categorize uh, 673 different uh, morpho species. Because we, I say it morpho species because some of these animals don't have a, a specialist to actually identify the species, so they lack uh, knowledge and they lack people that are interested in looking uh, at this. So we had to identify them by morphology. And what we could say is that, in fact, there is a tenacious pre-Columbian footprint. Also, keep in mind that these, these, these soils were created before European arrival. So, and then it stopped, and we cannot really ask anyone about how, how these soils are created. So, the, but the footprint is still there. We can see that there is a, a really a unique diversity. And 43% of the species in the study are only found in this um, anthropogenic uh, ecosystem, okay? So, and we also found that the, there is a diversity, the, the biodiversity changes in terms of the, the, the age of the forest. And also one of the less or most, not ex unexpected, but uh, certainly something for us to think is that agriculture, uh, in the way that is done in the Amazon as a monoculture uh, with soy and maize, even if it's on top of these dark earths, it doesn't matter. It actually, what we have seen is that there is an acceleration of the decay on the dark earths, even in comparison with the background normal soil. So we have seen that agriculture is imposing, uh, in the way that is done, is imposing a heavy effect on the soil diversity in Amazonia. Um, and sorry, here are uh, just to give you an idea about how the diversity in, in the anthropogenic ecosystem compares to the background. So here you see on the red, the red line is the reference sites so of the background, and then the black line is the, the Amazonian dark earth. And interesting, this is not usually when you see uh, the impact of humans, but in, in this case, it's very interesting because of the, the characteristics of this ecosystem. The diversity, although is, they both show unique fingerprints, in terms of uh, numbers of species, so here is basically uh, uh, numbers of morpho species, so morpho species diversity, with the sampling effort. So we sample more, and then you start, you see the increase in the number of morpho species. What we can say is that the, the number of uh, morpho species in both sites is really similar. However, they hold completely different fingerprints, okay? And we still need, because Amazon is such a huge area, what we actually need to do now is to, to develop more research. We need to go back increase our number of sites because what we have seen in old forests, so mature forests uh, in, in, in the Amazonian dark earth, in, in the dark soil, is that they seem to actually show more, to hold more diversity even than in terms, uh, when compared to the background. However, this is just extrapolation. So we don't, we need to, to actually uh, fill this with, with evidence. So we need to go back and increase the, the sampling effort. Okay, so main two, two messages is that, in fact, humans in the Amazon have changed the, the, the landscape in a way that became human dependent. And when I mean human dependent is that these ecosystems, the diversity that you see there, you don't find it, or at least at the same abundance, you don't find it in the background 
Amazon. So these are actually places that we need to, to preserve because not only the, the human history, the artifacts, all the complexity that can be explained in these places, but also the diversity fingerprints. And also uh, another learning, we can learn so much looking at the history. And in this case, learning from the traditional knowledge that the people in the Amazon developed for thousands of years can potentially help us to better understand and better preserve the, the mega diverse biome. And also just uh, to finish, there is a, uh, the, the TPI network where basically includes researchers, science communicators that are interested in looking at these anthropogenic ecosystems. And so people from scientists from all the fields looking at the same ecosystem, trying to understand and build layers of evidence to better understand the, the relationship between humans and the environment. So feel free to, to visit tpinet.org. There is also um, a newsletter that you, you can subscribe. And if you can always drop me an email if you need. I also need to recognize very briefly the people because these, the, that they are the, the people that actually supported the research. And we have George Brown from Embrapa, Brazil, and Pete Kiel from Cardiff Uni. But we are talking about more than 30 people that went to, the, to these places and helped us to, to map the, the diversity, the biodiversity in the soil. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Luis. I myself am a big interdisciplinary approach fan. So I uh, I love uh, the um, uh, I love the idea of uh, connecting the research of the soil fauna uh, to the history uh, and the human <clears throat> and the human footprint. Um, so uh, I love I love your message uh, when you said that soils are a living entity. That's um, yes, not a lot of people think about that, unfortunately. And uh, well, the the biota of the soils uh, uh, provides so much to the uh, to the humanity. Um, so my my question is. Uh, what can we uh, what can we do to to be an asset uh, to sustaining the soil biodiversity? Well, there is so much we can do. Obviously, we need more education about these organisms. We need more people to put their hands on the dirt and dig. And there is there is a lot happening at the moment. I think is a a great time to be a soil scientist, and people are getting more interested. So, uh, if first scientists need to reach more the population, reach more the uh, education uh, programs and include and so, so we can all be looking with more caref a careful look at the, the soil that you, you can hold in your hands, obviously. But uh, and yeah, well, we still need also a lot of resources. So I, I would suggest that soil is still an unknown universe. It can be widely explored, and the we certainly need that for sure. Yeah, definitely. If we if we take science apart for just one minute uh, and uh, think about the uh, local communities, especially around the Amazon region, which is so rich uh, in terms of soil biodiversity and global biodiversity, um, what um, what would you suggest to do to raise awareness to uh, intrigue people? Uh, so that they go out, dig a little deeper, and uh, well, learn more about the soils and how to use them, and how and which footprint, which is very important, they leave. You know, one one important message. I went to to the Amazon in a different study with ethnobotanists. So they work with people. They do ethnography with the knowledge of of people. And one important message is actually to elevate what people already know. So they really, they understand, they perceive the environment because they live there. So sometimes it's just to give proper importance 
to the traditional knowledge, include the people with you know important roles in the conservation planning. And these traditional communities, they have so much to offer that they can learn not only with themselves, but obviously with the with the, with the scientists that are working there, but certainly the connection with in the field, going to the field and develop, for instance, in schools, who take the knowledge back to the school in these places will make a huge difference. But more important is to talk to people, to, to, to overcome the intercultural barrier and give proper value and you know, have them in the middle of the conversation. I would say that that will be very important for them also to, to proper value what they have there. So that's for sure one of the pathways that we, we should, we must explore. Yeah, <clears throat> yes. Um, well, great. And we still have a couple of minutes and I'm sure everybody would love to know what your next research project will be focused on. Maybe have some predictions. No, actually, what, what we are doing now, and it's really interesting, I, I don't think I have slides here, but so we are trying to learn from what we have seen in the Amazon. And we had a, a student looking into the ingredients of the Amazonian dark earth and trying to see how much of that could actually replace a conventional fertilization system. And we found that without adding you know, any fertilizer, we could get the same kind of plant production that we get on the conventional uh, artificial fertilizer. So now we are trying to understand how that could work as a, a learning from our knowledge that we took from uh, the Amazon. But in particular, what I'm interested in is on the interactions between the fauna in the snow, in the blow ground. So for instance, how, how earthworms, we know that, and you go to a, a producer, to an agricultural agri farmer, and you ask, what do you think about earthworms? Mostly they will say, oh, they are good for the soil. But there is no mechanistic mechanism that we can say, well, they, we know of different things, but actually, how earthworms communicate with plants. They must, we know that if you have the earthworm in your pot, the plant will grow better. But actually, what is the molecular mechanism between both? And if there is any other intermediate in the middle, like the, all the microbial life that is in the soil. So my, my next question will be to put focus on these interactions below ground between plants, the animals, and the microorganisms. Wow, um, I love your projects and I love the spark in your eye, uh, which everybody, I'm sure everybody can see as you speak about what you do. Um, that's so great. Thank you very much for this very engaging uh, speech. Uh, we all will be so, um, so excited to see the results of your uh, following projects. Uh, and well, hopefully uh, dig the Amazonian soils together with you one day. Well, that would be amazing. Thank you, Olga. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to contribute to this amazing event. I hope that everything goes well until the end. I'll be looking also at the, at the talks for sure. Thank you very much. Have a great day.